welcome to the very first Facebook Journalism Project Hackathon. One of the key parts of the Facebook Journalism Project is bringing together the news industry with engineers, product developers from Facebook so that they can build things together um, very early in the development process. Today, the journalism industry faces many challenges. So we're introducing the Google News Initiative, our effort to enable journalism to thrive in a digital age. It will enable new models for sustainable journalism, elevate quality journalism, and ensure that technology allows journalists to do their jobs even better. Because when journalism succeeds, we all do. Is there a remote control for the slides? Is there a remote control for the slide? Yeah, super. Okay. And. Uh, Let's go for it. <laughs> I don't know if I got the pronunciation right, but... <gasps> okay, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, lovely, another lovely sunny day in, uh, in Perugia. Um, come in, come in from the rain, take shelter, and let's talk about transparency of media ownership. My name is uh, Helen Derbyshire. And I'm the executive director of an organization called Access Info Europe. And we work on increasing transparency, primarily focused on transparency of governments, but also uh, transparency of, um, I'm going to sit down as well, uh, transparency of the media, for example. We're not going to talk on this session about who owns the media, specifically. We're not going to be naming names or doing exposés. What we're going to be looking at is the challenging question of how do we make transparent who is behind the news? How do we get to find out where information is coming from? We're going to do that looking at a more kind of traditional model or traditional models of media ownership, but we're also going to touch upon the new challenges which are being talked about in many of the panels here in Perugia, uh, where we've got these challenges of fake news. Where is it coming from? How do we find out who is behind where information is coming from? Even as journalists, I mean, how many people in the room are journalists? Working as just many of you, okay, a good, good proportion. And how many of you are student journalists wanting to be journalists? The rest of you, right, almost. <laughs> Great. Um, so how do you as journalists doing your fact checking uh, find out where news and information is coming from that may be widely circulating, but who's behind it really? So there's a lot of questions about how we ensure uh, transparency of media ownership. It's not only for um, knowing where the news is coming from, but it's also about uh, ensuring plurality, as we'll hear. So let me introduce our, our panelists. Um, I'll start from the, uh, the, my far left over there. Um, um, Matthias Erkila, more or less, I tried. <laughs> Thank you. Managing editor at Svenska Ule. Ule. Oh, okay, Swedish-speaking division of the Finnish, of the Finnish uh, public media. And you're also an expert, or you've, you've looked at the blockchain and the possibilities that it offers to journalism. So you'll be talking, you're actually going to speak uh, last, yeah. looking to the future with blockchain and, and how that works. Um, and then I've got uh, Rachel Crawford-Smith, a reader in media and European law at the University of Edinburgh also uh, been at the European Institute in Florence, in, here in Italy, not too far away from Perugia, 
looking at questions of freedom of speech and broadcasting, and also been working for quite a number of years now, Rachel, because I've been working with you for a few years on this, on transparency of media ownership. And the tab for Alina has totally gone here. So Alina Ostling. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, I am Alina Ostling. I'm a researcher at the European University Institute in Florence. Uh, and Alina, you're actually going to get the ball rolling by speaking first. Do you want to, how do you want to do it? Do you, are you going to sit down, stand up? Yeah, I think it's nice. Let's get a bit, keep, keep thing. We're a bit, we're a bit behind the desk here. Yeah, it's a huge desk. So let me hand the microphone over to Alina. Um, so, yeah, I'll try to handle both at the same time. So, yeah, I will be speaking about transparency of media ownership from the perspective of the Media Pluralist Monitor and the actual evidence we have in Europe of how transparent information on this is. So, okay. But it's not personal conviction, is it? Yeah. Sorry. It should be this switch. Yeah, is it on? Maybe it's not on. Hmm. It's yeah, not sorry on. about it. Okay. Now. No? Yeah, now. Yep. So, yeah, why is media ownership transparency important? Uh, well, we are all aware that we live in an age of communicative abundance and uh, uh, we have even um, a concept called attention economy. So, uh, many different players and big players are competing for our attention on a daily basis. So it's really uh, important to understand who is actually speaking to us, um, as this uh, allows us to understand um, uh, if the information is reliable, what context it comes from, and what interests are behind the information we get. And this is for even more important uh, in news. Uh, allows us to make better informed decisions as citizens as, and as users of media. So basically the Media Pluralism media, uh, Monitor is, uh, has been developed by the Center for Media Pluralism and Media Freedom, where I used to work. And um, uh, it is a survey uh, carried out by national experts, and the last round covered 31 countries, uh, EU 28 member states, uh, Montenegro, Serbia, and Turkey. And we uh, covered four large areas, basic freedom of communication, social inclusiveness for different groups of people, uh, political influence uh, of, on media, and market plurality. And this last area contained an indicator on ownership transparency. Oh, opa, yeah. So when we tried to frame the results that we got, when we actually developed the indicator, we tried to look uh, at how there can be transparency, but uh, the information can still be opaque. Transparency is more accessible and it's more understandable. If we then move on to accountability, you can have different shades of accountability. It can be either soft or hard. And if you have soft accountability, we uh, conceptualize it as if you had uh, legal uh, provisions that um, have some kind of sanctions for illegal behavior that is in our case not informing about who the owners of media companies are and the hard accountability is actually applying this type of sanctions. Uh, we look at both upward accountability and downward accountability. Upward it's reporting to public bodies and downward it's reporting to the general public to, so to everyone. And what we found, looking at the legal frameworks in these countries, is that all of them have uh, general provisions. So they all have some kind of tax law or uh, regulation on uh, companies needing to provide information to company registers. But it's not always accessible to, to a general citizen. And uh, it's often very technical, very, very complex data, and it's of, often have to be paid for. Um, we then looked at media-specific provisions because these ensure um, wider access and better access to this type of information. And only 24 countries have this type of provisions in the law. Um, of these, 23 disclose to public bodies. But we assume that if you disclose to public bodies, they might not always be independent and they might not be transparent. So they might keep the data for themselves. 
So we look at how many disclose to the public, and it's only fortune, fortune legislations in 14 countries that give wider access to the public. Um, if we look at the level of detail, only seven have legal provisions about the ultimate owners, where beneficial ownership. Uh, and even there, there are limits to the data because uh, there are different provisions in different countries. So some of them ask for revelation of ownership beyond 5% of shell hoarding, some of them beyond 25. And uh, the legislation doesn't cover all types of media, print, broadcast, and online in many instances. Finally, if we go to the actual accountability, like we saw before in the model, there are only five countries that actually apply sanctions for non-reporting or for reporting incorrect information. Um, it can be fines, revocation of licenses, or um, uh, suspended public subsidies. But uh, in reality, uh, most of these are just warnings to the companies. And in some countries, they are rarely applied, even if they are in theory. So we conclude that uh, the law in Europe doesn't actually guarantee hard accountability, real accountability of media ownership. Access is not encouraged, and it's very difficult for, for example, uh, cross-border investigations to see data on global media companies or media companies that own uh, media in different countries. It's, uh, it tends to be very com costly and complex. Um, uh, one limit to our analysis and actually to the law in many countries is that it uh, covers mainly traditional media. So it doesn't cover online media, which is growing, as you know. Um, and this represent, the online environment represents a bigger challenge uh, of uh, analyzing both ownership of media and ownership of content. And my colleagues will speak more about this aspect, and I hope we can discuss it also with the audience afterwards. Thank you. Great, fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Alina. Um, I'll allow anyone, since we, we like transparency and access to information, anyone who wants to ask a question of Alina now or a clarification, feel free. Do we have anyone with a burning question or something you'd like to clarify? All right, seems not. So, uh, Actually, I'll stay sitting. Cause you're going to stay sitting, yeah, Rachel, yeah. so I just <laughs> need to it's get easier. your... Yeah. It's probably this other presentation here. Yep. Yep. Let's roll. All right, and do you want the little controller? Yep. There we go. You're ready. Okay, well, I'm going to speak a little bit about the legal background. As we've seen the microphone. microphone. Oh. We should put our okay. off the computer. Try, try with this one. Give me that yeah. one back. Okay. Yeah. That good? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes? Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the legal background to all this. I've put up a picture of the life of Brian, and you, for those of you who've seen this comedy film, Mother Old, you may remember that there's a joke where one of them asks, what has the Romans ever done for us? And people think for a while, and then they start to come up with all sorts of ideas as to what the Romans have done, like aqueducts and roads and all the rest of it. It's a bit like that with uh, the international law background. At first, and you can't really think of anything very much, but after a while, you begin to think that actually the law has set in position some very important principles, and the question is, how can we get those into practice? As Alina has explained, um, some countries do have rules, and we have about, I think, 13 or 14 countries that require uh, information about ownership to be made available to the public, uh, but often the sanctions are very limited, and in many countries there's, there's very little information available. But in fact, the international principles and legal background are setting some very important standards, and so I'm going to look at those in a bit more detail. Um, it's gone quite a bit too far forward. Let's go back. Okay. Um, if we look at the basis for it, first of all, I think we can see that there's a human rights basis, and then there's a company law basis, a corporate governance basis. In the context of the human rights basis, there are really um, 
two uh, principles that are underpinning uh, transparency. One is freedom of expression, and the other is the right to vote and to participate in public life. And both of those uh, rights are recognized in some of the key international documents. Uh, the first is the 1966 International Covenant on um, Political Rights, Civil and Political Rights, which contains a provision, Article 19, on freedom of expression, and Article 25 on the right to participate in public life. And at the European context, we've got the European Court of Human Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights. And Article 10 of that and the first protocol, the third article, has parallel provisions on freedom of expression and the right to participate in uh, elections and to have fair and effective elections. Article 11 of the Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights of the EU also provides for uh, freedom of expression, but it has a very specific provision on media pluralism. So what do these mean in practice? We can see that they don't say anything directly about media ownership transparency. But there's been a development in the law, and I'm looking here at the European context, from a context in which Article 10, that provision on freedom of expression, was seen as essentially a negative uh, provision, one that restricted the states and public bodies from censoring or restricting the media um, to more recently a positive, a positive obligation on states to set in place an enabling um, environment in which the media, media can perform its democratic role. And a very important case is the Centro Europa Sette case. It's an Italian case uh, from, I think, 2012. Uh, in which the court said states have this positive obligation to put in place a, uh, an enabling um, uh, environment for uh, freedom of expression. And it made reference, which is very important, the court made reference to a 2007 Council of Ministers recommendation. And by making reference to that, they started to incorporate these political recommendations into the legal provisions, in particular Article 10. And the... Uh, recommendation here is the 2007 recommendation and as you can see it calls on member states to adopt the regulatory and financial measures necessary to guarantee both pluralism media pluralism but also media transparency and in 2018 there's a second and very important uh, Council of Ministers recommendation on media pluralism and specifically on transparency, which recognizes again that member states are actually under an obligation to put in place a system which guarantees media ownership transparency. And if any of you are interested in a fairly developed international um, law uh, set of principles as to what this entails, this 2018 uh, recommendation is extremely important. And as you can see here, it says that states uh, should strive to put in place this enabling environment, uh, and it looks to both direct ownership and beneficial ownership, and it suggests that states should put in place requirements both for the media themselves to make available information as to who owns them, but also that they should ensure that there is a central database that's put forward by an independent organization which gives access to up-to-date, timely um, information on both direct and beneficial ownership and makes that available free of charge. So this is a very, very far-reaching uh, set of international provisions established in 2018. I won't say a great deal more. Um, there are also a couple of legislative provisions. There's the uh, 1989 Convention on Transfrontier Television, which for the states that are party to it, um, and which are not also party to a, a parallel EU directive, the Audiovisual Media Services uh, Directive, requires in each state to make sure that the media regulatory authority makes in information available on capital holdings to anyone who asks for it. Uh, for those states, and I think there are about over 30 states that are members of this convention, for those that are also men members of a parallel EU directive, um, they are not bound by that provision. They are solely bound by the provisions in the EU directive. And rather disappointingly, that was amended recently to recognize the importance of media ownership transparency, but it doesn't impose, unlike the um, 
Transfrontier Television Convention a binding obligation. It only says that member states may make this information available about who owns the media. So rather disappointing. In terms of hard law provisions, we've got rather disappointing uh, picture at the EU level. Then just to, to pick up at the corporate level, as we're all aware, there are many requirements within states to make companies uh, make available information about shareholding so that investors know what they're invest investing in and also for the public to have confidence in the corporate system. And the EU has introduced a number of important measures, uh, both in terms of the transparency directive and also in relation to money laundering. And in particular, the money laundering changes which have just gone through require that uh, registers on beneficial own ownership to be made available to the public. So we've got um, rather limited human rights development, but we've got quite established corporate rules, but it's often very difficult with those corporate rules to actually get the information and to collate it and put it together if you really want to find out who owns the media. And so I'll just uh, wind up really um, with saying that um, uh, there are principles at the international level. We've seen that they've not properly been implemented in practice, and I think it's um, uh, one of the challenges for us to get states actually to start implementing these principles and putting them into effect. Um, so uh, beyond sort of highlighting their importance and encouraging states to act, uh, we, we might be able to do other things that various soft law mechanisms, we can encourage self-regulatory bodies to um, expect members uh, to be transparent if they want to be uh, part of that body. We can expect perhaps social media to do more to uh, encourage members to be transparent and WikiLeaks um, has, I think, uh, so Wikipedia has been referenced by um, uh, Facebook uh, in terms of providing information about uh, some of the media companies that, that they um, uh, provide access to. Reporters Without Borders has a very interesting in initiative called the Media uh, Ownership Monitor, uh, which for a number of countries, largely South America, but also um, some countries in, in North Africa, has provided very, very detailed but very user uh, friendly uh, sources which give very detailed information about media ownership. So using those as links uh, with companies on social media can provide the public with use useful information. And finally, one can possibly provide benefits, fat advantages, tax, adv tax advantages, uh, give charitable status to those organizations that are prepared to be transparent about their ownership. So the various uh, soft law or incentives that can be provided to encourage greater ownership transparency. Um, so uh, the future, but uh, it's going to be, a, I think, a big challenge to, to, to turn what is a set of principles into practical reality, as Alina has said. Okay. Thanks, very, thanks very much indeed. Uh, Rachel, I, before I, I was going to give a little presentation, but really super brief about the, uh, the work that we've been doing um, to promote the standards on media ownership transparency. Um, but I just wonder, well, before I pull that up, in, what we've heard is that we've got a situation where in practice we can't get the information, uh, where we haven't really got laws in place in most countries. We've had very recent declarations, really, from the Council of Europe um, saying that we need to have these, the, these, these rules, but we don't have them yet. They've emerged to the extent that we're beginning to get something. It's emerged not out of concerns about having transparency about the media. It's emerged out of the work that many, many people in other panels probably right now are talking about, organizations like the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, uh, Panama Papers, LuxLeaks, etc., um, who've been exposing the need to have greater transparency of the owners of companies more broadly. Um, so, why do you, I'm just curious, do, do either of you have an analysis, um, or Matthias as well, do you have an analysis of why you think there's been so little political will to act on this? What's the obstacle been to getting these, uh, these adopted? Have you, have you got any thoughts on that? I mean, I think, I think any kind of media regulation is always highly controversial, and there are questions also about to what extent, across the board, you would always expect media ownership to be transparent. There are questions about um, uh, protection of journalists that, 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 that underpin that. 
Um, I think states have obtained information, but it's tended to be quite limited. I suppose that the law is just not kept up to date with developments. I mean, media regulators who have licensed um, uh, broadcast um, services have tended to collect the information because they've wanted it for licensing processes. But in the print sector, uh, it's been thought, you know, pretty much that the state should be not intervening in that field. But as we go online, the, the law hasn't sort of adapted to it. So I think it, mm. it's just a failure to uh, recognise the importance and see how that can be developed. I don't know. Alina, do you have comments on that before I... Yeah, um, I don't have any uh, good explanation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Mat I know. Yeah. Matthias, is it? Can I ask Rachel about the, you mentioned briefly about the funding benefits. Mm. How do these work? I mean, uh, uh, yeah, please. Thank yeah, you. They're, not, they're not in place as I as I know at the moment. It's a suggestion, but I mean, there are, there are questions in the UK about providing certain media with benefits. One would be obviously uh, uh, newspapers have had VAT relief. Uh, many countries now may consider giving VAT relief to online services, or they give they give you know particular funds for certain types of, of media. There's a question also about charitable relief in the UK, which would give you exemption from certain taxes. But if those were linked to certain standards of journalism and an openness, then that would give an incentive for companies to make that information available. Okay, thanks. Um, a quick straw poll of the audience. How many of you here, just with your hands, how many feel that we really should know who is exactly who is behind the media? How many people feel that we should have this transparency? Pretty much total majority. A couple of people look hesitant there, but uh, was there someone who really is there someone who really thinks that we don't need to know, that we shouldn't know, that media have a right not to say who they are? No. Okay. Rachel? I mean, can I come in on that? I mean, yes. Th the question is if, if one starts to regulate, as one has often with the broadcast sector, you then have to make a very difficult decision about which media you're, get, you're going to bring within this. Um, and, you know, the. As the uh, sort of legacy media go online, maybe it's easier to see that these are sort of sort of major providers yeah, still. Yeah. But where do you where do you draw the line? Yeah, there's some tricky questions, and we'll discuss those a little bit more. Um, I'm just going to tell you from the point of view of a civil society organisation that works on transparency, what we've tried to do, working with uh, with Rachel and, and Alina. I mean, you've been part of these projects as well um, over the years. Uh, of a sort of group of academics and civil society groups and, and journalistic organizations to try to develop some standards. So we had a whole process of doing research, interviewing different stakeholders, including government officials, um, media regulators, audiovisual regulators, and we came up with a set of standards. Um, we were looking to see if we can get propose a way to get accurate and up-to-date information on who really owns media outlets. Why, I've already mentioned, because we need to know whether the, the biases and perspectives are coming from, and because if governments have an obligation under the same Article 19 of the international treaties that you mentioned, governments have an obligation to deliver freedom of expression, which implies ensuring a space for media plurality. And how can governments know that there's media plurality if we don't know who owns the media? So that's very important from a freedom of expression perspective. Um, the current situation, we've already heard about it. Uh, it's not good in practice. <laughs> um, and the recommendations that we developed, which fed into those Council of Europe recommendations very much, they were discussed by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Um, they were based, as I said, on good practice and following a, a very extensive consultative process. Um, we said that certain basic information should be published, that it should be free and findable, not hidden away, um, buried in websites, that it should be regularly updated, that's very important, uh, in open formats for the open data people around, uh, having everything in open data formats is important. That gradually, if, if countries start with minimal transparency, they should progress. Uh, that, that we should really be able to see it, the, the transparency of influence, um, which could also uh, be transparent, greater transparency around uh, advertising and 
not only about who owns the media, but uh, um, for example, in particular, when uh, government bodies are buying large amounts of advertising in the media, that can uh, <coughs> have, a, have a significant impact on the, on the way that the media line. The legal framework, if you're going to have one, needs to be clear, and I think that's one of our biggest challenges in this world in which we are seeing you know, the convergence and, and new medias and what is actually a media outlet um, who is actually a journalist? That's, that's a big challenge to have a clear leg, legal framework in this modern context that we have. Um, and an independent oversight body to ensure that this works in practice. That's absolutely important. That the information should be disclosed directly to the public. So we shouldn't only rely on the oversight body and the governments to check on the plurality, but members of the public, other investigative journalists, should be able to know. Uh, who the owners of media are and to run their stories and their exposés um, if necessary, if you have the owner of a media being very close to a particular government minister or to a company that's winning procurement contracts, the usual kind of story. Um, and that we should be able to get uh, access transnationally and the information should be in a format that's comparable. So th there's quite a lot of, of goals that we set. Um, they are taken up in the recommendations, but as we've heard, not yet translated into, uh, into reality. And I just had a slide here, which I'm not going to go into in detail, but we looked at what was reasonable in terms of the percentage of ownership, and most people agreed that any shareholdings over 5%, it would be reasonable to, um, to, to, make, to, to require be made public. So that's, that's quite a small number, for only 5%. Um, but, it's, but it's important if we're if knowing how company structures are complex and 5% here and 5% there can actually add up to 90% somewhere higher up the chain. Okay, so that's a very brief presentation of the, the principles and the work we've been doing from civil society to promote those. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll listen to our... If there are no more questions at this point, does anyone have a question or, on what we've talked about so far? Yes, please. I'll bring you the mic. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm, I'm Natalie Nugret. I'm with The Guardian. Thanks for those really interesting uh, points. My, my question is, um, it seems to me the Council of Europe is a body that has literally no power whatsoever um, in terms of seriously, uh, you know, getting anything implemented in terms of uh, fundamental values, media pluralism. It apps, you know, at, I'm, we're talking about the Council of Europe, meaning a, a, a body which includes, you know, very democratic places like Kazakhstan. Okay. Well, uh, so, Kazakhstan not, but Azerbaijan yes. Oh. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Kazakhstan isn't in it? I think no, it's 47, 47 countries in the European region. It doesn't extend to Central Asia. It oh. goes as far as the Caucasus, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Russia, yes, Ukraine, yes, but not Kazakhstan, not the Central Asia. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, yeah. but okay, yeah. Azerbaijan, um, Armenia. Yes. Um, well, even these days, Hungary, Belarus, there's another panel Belarus, on Hungary. Belarus is, Belarus is not is, a member. Okay, yeah. has been. Okay, sorry, no, not, I should have not, been more never. precise. My yeah. point it's is... Okay. It's okay, it's okay, the point is valid. My point is, um, <laughs> it seems to me the, 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 it's the EU that can actually, um, you know, as an organization, um, do something about situations in which we would worry about media pluralism and media ownership. So... We've all heard a lot about, you know, what the EU's tried to do in terms of defending uh, fundamental rights in Hungary and Poland. There are f official procedures underway. Um, but my question is, you know, on this question of media ownership, what, how would you assess the EU's actual action on that, on that level? And the second, second, small, second question is media ownership, I mean, transparency of media ownership and media pluralism are not exactly the same thing, it seems to me. They're not exactly the same thing, right? You, can, you, you, can, you may well have different owners, but if, if the media they control more or less say the same thing or, or go in the same direction, then you don't have media pluralism. So how do you, how do you crack that one? And, and what, are, what is the criteria to make sure that even if we do have transparency on media ownership, uh, we also cover that other question, which is, is this, is this enough uh, of a criteria for genuine media pluralism? Thanks very much. Two really, two 
two really uh, important questions there. Um, one about the, the, the current weakness, really, of, of the Council of Europe, this 47 member state region um, that, that isn't uh, perhaps as influential, anything like, isn't as, anything like as influential as it was 20 years ago, and the role of the European Union. And the other, um, I was saying that you need transparency to guarantee media pluralism, but absolutely that it, transparency isn't enough. Um, comments from our panelists? Uh, yeah, maybe I can uh, reflect briefly on this. Uh, when I was making the presentation, I was trying to make a short presentation, and I was thinking whether to speak about media pluralism and transparency of um, uh, media ownership. And uh, there are different views also in the literature. I mean, there are authors that says that uh, in order to have a pluralistic landscape, you need to have uh, a number of different owners. But others say uh, that this, uh, as exactly as you say, uh, different owners can come from the same party, political party or, or whatever. So that is why I also emphasize that it's important to know who is speaking to you. So you know, as a user, as a citizen, who is behind the media outlets that are talking. Uh, and then you can judge yourself whether you want to trust them or not. So. I think your question is a, is a really good one. And I, I think it's a bit disappointing because the Council of Europe has developed these wonderful guidelines, really thoughtful, um, penetrating guidelines. Uh, and on the other hand, the EU, in a sense, has the power, but it's not really been a human rights institution. Um, so it can, it can deal with media pluralism to some extent through competition, although pluralism is not something that it really takes into account in that context in terms of diversity. Um, the interesting thing is that there is an interchange between the two because the, the recognition of human rights in the EU context, the Article 10 standards set a, a minimum um, and in recognizing uh, human rights in the EU context, um, there is a, a requirement also not only just to, to respect, but also to, to promote them in some way. Um, so although the failure, I think, in the audiovisual media services directive, the EU directive, to recognize strongly the importance of media ownership transparency as it stands at the moment, um, I think one could push a little bit more at that and say, if that's a reflection of, say, Article 11 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU, which recognises media pluralism, and, and in a sense, media transparency is a sort of a precondition or an a a aspect of that, uh, that they should be pushing that. And then the European uh, Regulators Group, which helps to implement and does research on the application of the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, uh, one could try and encourage them to put pressure on the states. But I mean, it, it, there's a difficulty for the EU because it doesn't have this direct human rights um, um, responsibility. So it's always through the sort of back door. So it's rather unsatisfactory. We've got these two institutions, one who've got perhaps more limited power, though I wouldn't discount, I mean, some countries, they have actually been able to be quite influential, but the state has to want to have them to go in and assist them. So I wouldn't write that off. Those standards can feed through into EU law, but the EU has been very reluctant to go ahead just directly on uh, freedom, although Hungary and uh, Poland are cases where we can begin to see them taking a country-specific view. Yeah, just come on, but I had a question as, as well. You have a question as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to make just one additional comment on this, which is that we, um, you, you've got both a comment and an intervention coming up, so for the, for the 15, 20 minutes we have left, you're very well set up. Um, uh, we did have a number of hearings at the EU level. The EU was actually exploring, just as Rachel said, really exploring how it might be able to justify taking action, but it kind of fizzled out in the end. I, I don't know, um, and, and, and I, it was a bit disappointing that they weren't, they didn't really pick it up and run with it. Um, and I have to say that in the last couple of years, um, I haven't seen much movement at all. There was a moment, but it was three, four years ago now that the EU was more looking at this. Um, uh, I don't actually think the EU has been strong enough on Hungary or Poland uh, at all. Um, and, and that's a shame because of the pressure on the media, pressure on civic space in Europe, pressure on freedom of expression um, within the European Union or in the, in the neighborhood countries um, is, is a serious challenge that we've got. And um, it's been disappointing perhaps that the EU 
has, has been treading a little bit too gently on that, I would say. Um, we have a lady here. I don't know. Um, let's, let's hear the two questions, and then we'll figure out how it goes. So. Okay. There, yeah, that's fine if you want to integrate this in later. But um, my name's Sally Lehrman, and I lead the Trust Project. And we are an international consortium of news organizations that are basically doing voluntary transparency. And one of, and through these trust indicators, and one of them is about best practices, and specifically we ask news organizations to describe their ownership. And we often have to go back to them and say, you know, say more about what does it mean, for instance, to be a publicly held company, to trade shares, and, or tell us more about specific private owners, and so on. So I have two questions. One is, how gets to the, is transparency enough? Because we grapple with this question, how, and we, did I say we're in five European countries, uh, US and Canada, so um, Latin America, but we wonder, is, that, is it enough to just state these things? Because I just, does the public, like if, if a news organization is willing to be honest about we have this corporate influence or we have this um, government influence, we take X percent of advertising from government, how well can the public actually interpret that information? So it seems to me there's like another piece which is making the public aware of how to interpret this. And then secondly, I'm curious how, what kind of response you've had to your work among media companies, because I think it's just excellent and fascinating. Very much for the question, um, Matthias. Do you want to either respond and/or add your question, and we'll get them keep it going. My question is slightly on the same lines. Okay. And, as, but good questions. I think you should take this. Uh, my question, as a journalist, I'm sort of wondering what you talk about bias and influence. Some, like, what bias are you talking about? We are objective journalists. As a question. How well is it documented that the ownership has some? Uh, does it do we take it as a granted that the owners actually have a big say about the published content, or not? Okay, very, very interesting question. So, uh, do we does ownership influence content, and um, is transparency enough, um, particularly when your challenge is building trust? Um, Alina, would you like to have a go on that? I can have a quick go. I was just reading a, um, a report from Russia and uh, uh, they were telling about the local government owning media and uh, actually it was a journalist, a Russian journalist uh, was on training, uh, media training in Sweden and she was telling about her day-to-day -day work and she was telling that uh, every day uh, the governor calls her media outlet and ask them uh, to see what they will have on the agenda. And then uh, he either approves or deletes certain items. Uh, and that's how the, <laughs> he, uh, that's the direct of effect of ownership. I guess what I want to say is that it depends on the context and on the country. Of course, Russia is, uh, is a quite an extreme environment for journalists, but uh, it's, there are different, definitely correlations between ownership and uh, media influence. Yeah. Yes, I mean, just uh, it doesn't have to be Russia. It could be the UK with, obviously, Rupert Murdoch and the, and the Sun and not all his newspapers, but uh, that's a, a, a good example. Um, I think your question is a really good one about how you can make this information accessible to uh, individuals. Um, some countries, I mean, I think, I think Net the Netherlands, their media authority uh, publishes um, information to the public and tries to contextualize information about ownership, which is very, very valuable. Um, and I mentioned the Reporters Without Borders uh, approach. And if you look at their country reports, they are, I think I've only just looked at these recently, but they, they do seem to be brilliant. And, you know, you can click on the uh, particular shareholder. It, it links you up uh, with their uh, information, particular owners, um, very accessible. So, I mean, people are actually producing some very user-friendly ways of uh, getting access to this information, but it's time-consuming and updating it is costly. Okay, thanks. I mean, I, 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 I don't know how well it's been sort of proved at a, a sort of statistical or academic level, but I, I don't think there's a journalist that I've ever talked to who hasn't said, um, oh, well, yeah, that topic, our media doesn't touch because they 
that company advertises a lot, or that person is in the same political party as our owner or whatever. I mean, it's at an anecdotal level. I think we can all find examples of that. Um, is transparency enough for trust? This is a, I work primarily on access to information, freedom of information laws, so my primary transparency target is governments. And we have this debate about declining levels of trust everywhere. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, more transparency for trust. And I actually don't think that transparency, certainly not alone, is sufficient to bring trust, just like transparency isn't sufficient to bring pluralism of the media. Um, I think we need a lot of other mechanisms. We need transparency and we need accountability mechanisms. It's fine if journalists can get hold of information which reveals that the government's correct, but unless there are consequences, unless there are prosecutorial investigations, unless there are resignations, um, you're not going to have any impact on public confidence in the system. Um, so I think, I think that's one, one observation on your question. And the other one is that I do think that um, when information is made public, it requires a... Um, the role of the infomediaries, it requires analysis, interpretation, to give it meaning. The information per se alone isn't sufficient. I think we also need to give it meaning. Okay, we have another question there, and I want to make sure that Matthias has time for his presentation on okay, blockchain and media ownership. So, Damien, you have the mic. Hi, I'm Damien Tambini, and I was really pleased to hear the Council of Europe recommendation referred to since I spent two years on an expert group drafting it. Um, I mean, a, cu a couple of comments. The, the, um, the political question uh, and related to the weakness of the EU, I mean, they, they do, and if you look historically, right back to the 1990s, they do take on this issue of media plurality and ownership, and they get so far. And I think the obvious explanation is political pushback because of lobbying by media owners um, for why they don't take it any further. They got as far as having, a, in 2013, a meeting on best practices and where they kind of paraded the places that have good law on this like Bosnia, Austria and Finland I think. Um, but they, the, I mean I think that some of the things I think I wrestled with a little bit relate to another question which is in, a, in authoritarian countries um, do you really want to make the media more transparent in a blanket way um, and put a burden on them in meeting those requirements. I mean, it's something that I was slightly uncomfortable with, whether this is it may be a very good idea in Western Europe, but there may be circumstances in which this, we, we might want to, to, to think about um, you know, the, the, whether, whether or not we want to put that burden on, uh, on, on the media. So um, there, there, may be, there may be, I think, concerns with opening up media, making them more transparent. And the, the, the other point, I think, is related to why it hasn't been implemented. Yes, there's political pushback, but the question, I think, centrally is, there's a significant cost to making this work because it's not just dumping the data on a website somewhere, it's making it usable. And the policy question is who bears that cost, really, in terms of making that really very... Um, uh, usable and transparent for civil society organisations to use. And I don't think people have um, really wrestled with that and it's not something which is a high priority in today's world, although it should be. Thanks. Um, just on the question of the cost and the burden of the transparency, it's something that we looked at in our research and we found that um, in the countries that you mentioned, which is true, it's like Georgia, Austria, but Finland also, um, or in countries where there's kind of partial reporting, we, uh, including in interviews in Norway, I think we conduct, we conducted interviews in a number of countries, a, a range of countries, and we conducted interviews with media outlets, and we didn't find any evidence of the burden. Um, on the contrary, it, it wasn't, compared with the many um, reporting obligations that a, a business has, it isn't significant additional reporting. In fact, often quite a bit of the same information needs to be reported um, to the authorities uh, for money laundering purposes, for example, control of money laundering. So I, I don't think that and now we're going to get, in any case, we're going to get a requirement to report the beneficial owners under the, the EU's um, 
directive li linked to money laundering. So I, I think that the burden is, is not an important issue. I do think there's a question of the consequences of transparency in these countries where there is a huge pressure on the media. Um, although, and we have the same debate about transparency of civil society and where the money's coming from. Um, I think it's something that's, that's necessary and you have to put in place other safeguards. But I'll let the other panelists speak and I will give priority to Matthias because I, I think you really should give your presentation. Yeah. Well, um, so maybe we should just do that. And you can answer that question. Yeah, because you have something to say still. No, and the presentation's there. Okay, thanks. Or it's not there, it's here. No, it's up, up, so just, up, so just. Oh, is that good enough? Yeah, you have to start it from the, uh, start. Wait, 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 This, this works. It, yes, it works. Yeah, to be transparent, I work at the YLE, the, uh, the Finnish public service. Media, it's totally state-owned and 100% tax-financed in Finland. And I, the reason I'm sitting here is I worked as a visiting research fellow at the uh, same institution as Damien Tabin is from the uh, London School of Economics, journalism think tank police for one month in October, I was looking at blockchain for journalism. And then I published this report, if, you, if you're actually interested, you can look it up. The uh, topic it is what uses blockchain for journalism. It's available on LSE website. Shortly about blockchain, I try to be very, we, we can't st start defining blockchain here, it will take ages, but it's a way to actually just transact, uh, record transactions in a way that's actually openly available, immutable, and uh, distributed. And that creates trust in an environment that would be otherwise trustless. And that actually makes it very, very, as we have seen, the usual uh, implementation is, is money, or crypt cryptocurrency, as you have seen. But it could be used for other purposes also, and I've listed some of these potential uses that has, has, have been discussed in the media. Uh, environments, uh, I've bolded those that could be actually usable for this discussion. There's um, to actually to have a database for ownership, so you, you'd have to use, uh, of course, identity and contact, ma contact management and uh, immutable archives and logging and then, yeah. But at the moment, there's very, very few actually implementations of, of blockchain in, in the media environment. The only impl implementation is actually cryptocurrency so far. At the same time, there's lots of big tech activity. All the big tech companies, IBM, Amazon, Microsoft are working on their blockchain uh, implementations. Even Facebook is working on, on some kind of cryptocurrency system, reportedly working, uh, and, uh, and JP Morgan is actually in introducing an internal cryptocurrency system for money transfers. So if, if there should be a need, if there's a need for a, a database for actually tracking media ownership with block, a, a blockchain-based structure, it will be available very soon if you need, need that. But uh, then the question is that do these implementations actually follow the blockchain, the, uh, the uh, original vision to be open, uh, available, distributed? The private blockchains are not actually open. So the problem is that if you use a database from Microsoft to track media ownership, and Microsoft could actually be counted as a media, media company itself, then we already have a problem here. So uh, the point, maybe I'll just leave you with, with one quote from Lana Schwartz. If you are interested in blockchain and the, the visionary part of it, read Lana Schwartz. Excellent writings. One quote from her is that 
if all these projects, I mean, uh, it seems like if, if you follow the discussion around blockchain and cryptocurrency, it, it, there is not many positive uh, developments at the moment. So most of these thoughts, so most of these thoughts are actually in, in, in problem, in trouble at the moment. They're not working. If you, so, uh, but blockchain as a, as a what should I say, mm. it can be sort of looked as upon as a, uh, as Schwartz writes, inventor of desire. That, so what do, do we want? We want to have an immutable, open, distributed way of tracking media ownership. And it, it doesn't actually depend on blockchain if we have it or not. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. And um, we've got a couple more minutes left for last comments or questions or reflections or ideas um, or reactions to what some of our, our questioners from the floor said. Is, is transparency enough for trust? Should we make media transparent in countries where there are authoritarian regimes? Any, any thoughts or, or comments from anyone? from our panelists. Rachel, you're looking like you want to say something. <laughs> Not particularly, but uh, I mean, Damien's uh, question was a, is a very good one. I mean, again, going back to the Reporters Without Borders, I think they've developed some kind of middle system where if, you just, if, the, if the organization decides that they want to be anonymous, it's kind of filtered through that, and, and, and that means they don't lose any benefits that you might get from being prepared to be transparent. So they've kind of built that into their system. So, um, but I agree with you, in certain contexts, it would be absolutely crucial that that information is not made available. Yeah, I mean, the, the question is, if you're in a country where there is real pressure on independent journalism, whether or not the, the, the sort of authorities aren't always already aware of who's doing it. Um, I, th I think it also gets very complicated when we're talking about um, groups of journalists who are working as civil society organizations, kind of getting money from donors rather than working as a, exactly as a media, but doing investigative journalism, or where we've got individuals who are putting out news. Um, this, this scandal recently in the UK about this pro-Brexit campaigning in, in recent days where there are these news, fake news factories uh, coming up, how do we get to, to that? There, there's a huge question there which people have been debating with respect to privacy, whether everyone has to have a kind of verified identity to go online as a way of knowing where fake news comes from, which has you know, very serious potential consequences. Um, the logical extension of saying we need to be transparent about where news comes from could lead us to that. Where do we put the limits? How do we define which kind of transparency is good, which kind of transparency is too much. There are, there are questions there. Maybe we don't have the answers yet here today. Okay, uh, Sorry, last can, responses can I, from the team or last interventions from the floor? The team, the, the panel. Apart from saying it's already difficult and we haven't got very far with it. I mean. <laughs> well, we've got lots of challenges still ahead of us. In spite of been working on this for a few years, it's a channel, challenge for the future. It is 7 o'clock. It's probably time for an, um, an aperol spritz. Thank you very much Thank indeed you for coming. For, yes. to everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>